Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And it's uh, my great pleasure as one of the organizers of uh, this, along with Helen Warden and uh, Bill Randall, to invite, to uh, thank you for coming to this, uh, to this great uh, celebration of John's career here at uh, NCAR. I'm going to be giving the uh, first talk of this uh, tropospheric chemistry session or tropospheric uh, science session that we're going to have it this afternoon. And then we're going to hear from uh, quite a number of people about uh, different uh, EOS missions. And uh, it's going to be really uh, exciting to come down in altitude a little bit. So uh, my, what I'm going to do first off is to talk a little bit about the, uh, en the MOPI project at NCAR. And I'm going to stick with pretty much with some science stuff and talk about uh, the experience at NCAR because uh, Jim Drummond, the MOPI PI, is going to come up afterwards and talk about some of the uh, mission and his, his work with John planning the, uh, planning the mission and talking about the instrument. So my personal history, I, came, I, was, uh, I was working at Oxford um, in the same group as, uh, as, uh, as Clive, and I was thinking about, well, where shall I go and do a, a, do a postdoc? And I thought coming to the States sounded like a cool idea. And uh, Clive persuaded me that coming to NCAR would be really cool and that working with John would be a fun thing to do. And John was very kind uh, to offer me a, a position as a visitor and later as a postdoc. And so I came to work with him doing radiative transfer modeling uh, in general in support of um, pretty much all of the uh, instruments that we've, uh, we've talked about this morning. Uh, I worked on clays to start off with, and then I did some work on hurdles. But I, I think I started concentrating in the mid-90s working, uh, working on Moppet, and this is where I worked on the uh, radiative transfer modeling for Moppet, and later on uh, in basically trying to lead some of the uh, science activities. And for this uh, opportunity, which has pretty much shaped my career here at NCAR, I will be eternally uh, thankful to John and for giving me that opportunity. So uh, we've talked a bit about, uh, about the Terra satellite. The Terra satellite uh, carried the Moppet instrument along with others that we'll hear about this afternoon. Uh, it was launched, uh, launched back in 1999, so we're, we're, closing, we're closing on uh, 15 years. It's going to be a great celebration. And uh, some of us weren't actually at the launch. Some of us made the very bad decision after numerous days of uh, delays of thinking that it wasn't actually going to get launched. In, in, the, uh, in the December time frame. So I came home on the uh, Friday and it got launched on the Saturday. So I was really annoyed about that. <laughs> so some of us ended up in the pub instead where we uh, persuaded them to stick uh, the launch on the big TV rather than watching football games, although this was actually on a Saturday morning. So I don't think they had anybody else who wanted any, anything. They didn't want to watch NFL. They wanted to watch NASA TV instead. So <laughs> uh, that's where we saw it with a, and we watched it with a little with a, with a drink. Um, and there were lots of drinks that followed, especially because we couldn't, when they opened the, uh, opened the apertures and started looking at the data, we couldn't get anything to work. The uh, radiances that Moppet produced immediately crashed all of our algorithms, and we couldn't get any pictures out at all. And this was potentially going to be slightly embarrassing because both Jim and John were back at uh, NASA about, about to do a press conference showing the first light images. And uh, Mike King had got nice pictures from Modis and Dave Diner had got nice pictures from Miser and we got nothing. We got some uh, level one radiances which when you look at those are not very exciting to show. So. Uh, my biggest contribution probably to Moppet was the day before the press conference, I said this wasn't going to be good enough, and I sat down and wrote a very fast regression uh, code which basically linked our forward model radiances to the Mozart chemical transport model CO abundances, and then threw the Moppet radiances at it, and came out with a uh, something that looked as if it might be sort of right. It had, uh, I stuck a low CO and a high CO color bar on it, because um, <laughs> I got no way of actually fixing it to a reality. But then I looked at this, and I really didn't know whether it was right or not, because I'd been working on the stratospheric stuff before this, and I'd got really no idea of chemistry in the stratosphere. So I remember calling uh, Jean-Francois Lamarck up, who was a, up at the Mesa lab, and said, you've got to come down and help me look at this. He knew a bit more chemistry than I did back then. So d d have a look at this and tell me if it looks as if it might be right. So we pondered over this, and we actually compared it with some maps, profi uh, maps 
maps maps the maps was a shuttle instrument that came out of nasa langley and it was they had a couple of days worth of, of data and we actually said well it doesn't look too bad there's actually you can see some indications of high co in sub-saharan africa which they had attributed to biomass burning and we know china's polluted so maybe it's not too bad so there was a lot of work that followed from that trying to understand the, the biases that we've got in the radiances and looking at the noise values and Gradually, over the next few months, we actually got the, um, the uh, retrieval algorithms to work, and we reduced some of the biases, and we understood exactly what Moppet was giving us. It wasn't giving us anything out, out of, that it was wrong or anything. It's just that we hadn't anticipated some of the, some of the effects about putting the instrument in orbit, like uh, the filters. The, filter, the spectral filter passband shifted slightly due to a change in temperature and things like this. And so it picked up some different radiances, and all this had to be corrected. So we did a lot of work over the next few months to try and come up with some nice pretty pictures which we were lucky enough to uh, produce. And uh, after that, uh, everything's history. So this, is, uh, this was, shows a nice picture of Moppet. This is what Moppet shows. Moppet shows carbon monoxide in the atmosphere, an indication of uh, emissions from incomplete combustion. So wherever we have pollution, we have uh, CO. And this is what Moppet has uh, given us now, nigh on uh, 15 years' worth of data showing. So uh, here's a northern hemisphere picture. As you can see, pollution built up over the uh, northern hemisphere winter because we don't have very much photochemistry cleaning out the atmosphere. And you can see the big source regions in China, uh, industrialization in China. We have biomass burning, that band of biomass burning in sub-Saharan Africa. And then indications of long-range transport of this pollution. And then when you move into later in the year, uh, we have the northern hemisphere summer. Active photochemistry cleans out uh, the atmosphere, CO's lifetime is shorter, and you start picking up some indications of uh, wildfires there in uh, North America. Uh, you can see that, bit. and China still is an indication there of uh, industrial emissions, and the really strong uh, picture that we, I think we spent a lot of time in the early years trying to understand what we were seeing there in, in the southern hemisphere from the biomass burning in Africa and South America, producing that very large signal. Uh, also, at this time, we had a go at uh, doing data assimilation. And this is one of the first images of uh, chemical data assimilation that was produced by Boris Kadatov and J.F. Lamarck. Uh, this got a lot of airplay because it looked good. People liked to see it. And I think it was how much of this is actually Moppet and how much is Mozart, I'm not quite sure. I'm not going to comment on that. But it did at least show, uh, show the effect of um, uh, the long-range transport of, uh, of CO and what a good indicator, of tra a good tracer of pollution CO, CO is in the atmosphere. <laughs> So in this, uh, in this slide, I'm taking the liberty of condensing the whole of Clive's career into one cartoon <laughs> to, to illustrate, um, illustrate what we really did here at NCAR, which was to build the retrieval algorithms. Uh, so what you have there on, um, I don't have a pointer. OK, so on the, it's underneath this. Doesn't matter, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go through the equations, but essentially for, uh, for retrieval, what we're doing is mixing what we have for our new uh, measurements with what we think we already know from the atmosphere and coming up with a best guess. That's really what we're doing. And so we have the new measurements from Moppet. That, that's the Y-OBS up there. And then we have the forward model, which embodies our knowledge of the atmosphere and what we think we know. And then we do an optimal estimation between the two of them, throwing in some a priori data, which we use to constrain the, uh, the inversion. And we come out with a retrieved product, which is shown down there in the, um, in the, in the, lower, in the lower, lower box there. And an, an important part of the retrieve product that we need to make available to the community is not only the retrieval of carbon monoxide, the X there, uh, which was the distribution of the pollutant uh, throughout the atmosphere, but is the, this quantity A, the averaging kernel. So one of the biggest contributions of Moppet, I think, to atmospheric science is to teach everybody what an averaging kernel is. Because uh, we started putting out uh, the data and told people, well, you've got to use the averaging kernels. And they said, what? What's an averaging kernel? And then we say, well, Clive's written a book. Go and read his book. So they picked up Clive's book, and it's full of linear algebra and 
turn most of the modelers uh, turned them off, and they kind of we spent a lot of time explaining to modelers what averaging kernels were, which are essentially tell you where, when it, in a retrieved profile what is the mix of information that comes from your measurement and what comes from the uh, a priori constraints that you put in there uh, beforehand. And so it took us a long time to explain to people. And these show some of the averaging kernels for Moppet. And one of them there is, is labeled surface. So that's our surface retrieval. Uh, but you can see there, uh, that red line does not actually uh, peak at the surface. It peaks in, in the middle of the atmosphere, which tells us most of our information from the instrument, actually, from the instrument's measurement, actually came from the mid atmosphere, even though we call it the surface averaging cut. And so that took a lot of explaining to a lot of people. And uh, I think uh, we definitely did uh, instruments such as TESS and YAZI and everything that followed on uh, a great service by explaining the uh, averaging kernel to the community and having them uh, get ready for incorporating this in their, in their data uh, analysis. So here's a picture of, uh, of uh, four uh, musketeers, I guess. Uh, back in uh, July of 2005, this was at the occasion of the fifth anniversary of Moppet. There's John, uh, Dan Ziskin, who was our data manager, myself looking, I guess, uh, I, I haven't changed very much. And, <laughs> and Mary Dieter, who I noticed really hasn't changed very much. And uh, there's a Peter of us uh, just looking at uh, a poster. And uh, I took the liberty of going around the Moppet group and asking people for a few just one sentences for comments about what they thought of John. And... <laughs> These, these are just a, f a, few, a, few, a few comments, and I'm not attributing them to anybody in particular. <laughs> Incredible stamina and the ability to stay focused both on details and the big picture. I actually thought that my career here at NCAR was very limited, going to be very limited just because I couldn't keep up with John when it came to three-hour meetings looking at, uh, looking at Moppet data and things like that. Whereas everybody else was flagging, uh, people half his age were flagging, John was keeping going, and it was... Um, it was quite, a, <laughs> it was quite a, a challenge for some of us younger folks to, to keep up. A skilled moderator of different opinions. You wouldn't believe the arguments we had in the early days about a priori. <laughs> what kind of a priori should we use, how much of it, and all the rest of it. And uh, there were lots of different ideas on this. And John managed to steer a skillful course throughout all those uh, debates. Extremely patient, probably crucial for a satellite PI. John is a very, very patient man, and he kept most of this uh, on track, despite different setbacks at different times, and with, I think with the belief that everything would be okay in the end. Uh, fosters a spirit of self-reliance. This was, uh, I think this was in response to the fact that we decided to build our own data processing here and keep the processing here at NCAR rather than turn everything over to NASA just because we wanted to have control over what went into it and to be able to understand and have full, uh, full ability to change things as we saw, uh, saw fit and a strong commitment to product quality. It took us a long while to actually put out some validated Moppet data just because there was a lot of things to sort out, and John was insistent that what we, when we actually put the stuff out there, it was going to be of the highest quality. So we looked at fires. We looked at fires a lot in the early days, and here's a nice example from 2004 showing some Alaska wildfires. And this is just a good example of showing the value of CO as a tracer. So there, uh, Alaska's over here, and these were some of the biggest fires uh, on record in Alaska. And you can see the trace of uh, CO coming down over the North America then transported, long-range transport over the Atlantic and impacting, uh, impacting Europe. And so this was some of the first work. Uh, this was some of the work by, by Gabby Fister, in fact, in the group. Uh, what we did was an assimilation of this data into the Mozart uh, chemical transport model and uh, improved the emissions by doing this assimilation. And then also, by, as a virtue of having the uh, improved the emissions of CO, this is related to a lot of other gases in the atmosphere that we weren't able to measure at the time. We could see what the impact was on some other things, such as tropospheric ozone, which impact our air quality. Another thing we did in those early days was to compare a lot with uh, data from other instruments on Terra, especially from MODIS. And we were, did a lot of work looking at uh, comparisons of um, carbon monoxide and aerosol optical depth from MODIS and uh, MODIS fire counts. And here's just an example of, uh, this was uh, really impacted the air quality. These were Canadian fires, and they really impacted the air quality, especially over Washington about Independence Day of uh, 2002. And so we did, we did quite a lot of work on 
comparing Moppet and uh, Modis to just to try and understand these and understand the relationships between these different pollutants. Validation. We did a lot of work on validation in those early days as well. Now, um, one of our uh, primary collaborations in the early days was with uh, with NOAA, with Paul Novelli's group in NOAA, and they were flying flask samples, uh, taking uh, flask samples of CO at different altitudes in different places in the world. And this was our gold standard for uh, for validation. And we spent a lot of time comparing uh, Paul Novelli's data with our data, trying to understand the, uh, the the distribution of carbon monoxide in our uh, in the vertical in our retrievals. We also did a lot of uh, work looking at uh, FTIR data. This is an example from uh, David Griffith's group at the University of Wollongong in uh, New South Wales, uh, just south of uh, Sydney. And you can start to see here, this is after about a decade's worth of data, the, uh, the, Moppet, uh, the Moppet total column it can be compared to the FTIR total column. And you can see really nice agreement there between the interannual variability and also the seasonal cycles. And we can start to be able to pick out some of the different influences uh, that cause the different interannual variability, be it uh, fires, local fires, or large-scale events, which the satellite data have the advantage. They can give you a large-scale context to these local measurements from FTIR. So, for instance, in uh, 2004 there, there were, it was an El Nino year. There was drying, especially of some of the forests in Indonesia and big fires, which would then go, come down and impacted the southern hemisphere. Well, if you look at the FTIR data on, the o on their own, you don't necessarily get the, uh, the large-scale context that the satellite can give you. So we spent some time looking at uh, mixing data from uh, in situ measurements and uh, from the satellite to give us this large-scale context. Some other work we did was improving uh, emission inventories. Um, this was one of the first uh, field campaigns we were involved in, which was Trace, uh, the NASA Trace P campaign, which was looking at outflow from from uh, from Asia, and uh, they they flew here over out, out over the um, out over Japan, over, 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 looking at outflow from uh, from China itself, and we were able to do some comparisons between that data and the MOPIC data. Uh, it was one of the first times we were able to do a really uh, comprehensive comparison. And then both of these then provide uh, top-down constraints that can go into an inversion uh, along with our uh, previous information, what we think the emissions are in these regions, to come up with, um, come up with some uh, extended emissions. And so in the early days, we did a lot of work on improving emission inventories with, uh, with Moffitt data. And a lot of this, some of this work was done in uh, NOAA with Gabby Patron, uh, when, when, she, when she was here before she moved to, to NOAA, but uh, this has continued to be a, a theme that uh, Moppet has really c contributed to improving some of the emission inventories. So this has been uh, shown before. This was uh, back in, uh, I think, 2006 when we won the, um, the NCAR uh, Distinguished uh, Scientific Achievement and Technical Achievement Award, and this was the, uh, just a few of the uh, likely faces who were around at that time. And so I thought I'd take the opportunity of giving you a, a few more things that the people said about, um, uh, about John. The ability to balance complex project management and science requirements. Amazing knowledge and memorization. That was a thing I think that uh, a number of us have noticed over the years that John has got an incredible memory and he knows, he knows everything about everything as well. And science and engineering and encyclopedic knowledge. Door was always open. This was came from uh, one of our scientists. Who, a lot of us have always felt that John was available to uh, talk about everything from science to through to careers and everything else. Super nice. <laughs> <laughs> and this one I think is uh, really telling. I feel lucky to have worked under him, and I think that goes for quite a few people uh, within the group. So another achievement of Moppet, multispectral uh, multi retrievals. Moppet has demonstrated the ability of us to be able to do uh, multispectral remote sensing and get information from the lowest part of the atmosphere, which is really the, uh, one of the goals if we want to be able to do uh, predictions of air quality. So uh, Moppet measures, uh, measures carbon monoxide in two spectral bands, one in the uh, uh, thermal infrared at 4.6 microns and one uh, in the uh, shortwave infrared at 2.3 microns. And because these use essentially different uh, signals, different radiative transfer, we get different information from the signals that can be used differently in a, in a retrieval. 
So if we concentrate on the thermal infrared, as I mentioned before, this gives us information. This is a weighting function. It tells you pretty much where the sensitivity of the measurement is to the atmospheric uh, carbon monoxide in the vertical. And you can see there we have maximum sensitivity somewhere in the mid-troposphere. So if we consider doing a retrieval just using that and we say we want to know what's happening at the surface, well, we don't have too much information there from the measurement itself. And if we use a constant a priori, we come up with a surface uh, retrieval of carbon monoxide that looks like this, not very exciting, not very much information in there about what's happening at the surface. So then we can consider what's going to happen in the short wave. Uh, well, this gives us a, con uh, a sensitivity to the CO in the atmosphere, which is very much more uniform all the way down to the surface. And so if we do a retrieval of that now, yes, now we start picking up some of the information about what's happening at the surface in our retrieval. But the real advantage comes when you mix these two together, because essentially we're taking this little bit of information there and it's in there to tell us about what's happening at the surface when we come to do a, an air quality retrieval. And now we are able to come up with some uh, estimate of really what's happening towards the surface for uh, air quality applications. And this has been a really uh, groundbreaking demonstration from, from the instrument about uh, our ability to understand from Nadia remote sensing what's happening towards the surface. And this is being picked up now on a number of different instruments, combining different measurements from different satellites, uh, different satellite instruments to try and really understand what's happening for air quality applications towards the surface. Obviously now we're on approaching uh, 15 years worth of uh, data, so we can start looking for, uh, we can start trying to disentangle uh, the long-term trends from the interannual variability. And this showing some work uh, that has been headed by Helen. Uh, and you can see here the top, the top graph shows the seasonal variability, Moffitt's shown there in black. And certainly it seems in, the, in recent years as if there's been a, a, a fall off, even, even if you kind of squint at this and take out in your mind the, um, uh, the interannual variability, there's been a, been a bit of a drop off. And then we're able to, of course, now compare with some of the other instruments that we've got up there measuring carbon monoxide, AIRS, TESS, IASI. And uh, they, also, they also show something along the similar lines. So this is, this is a really interesting result, which I don't think is really fully understood yet. Obviously, decreasing emissions are, are, are probably a part of it. Uh, but we're seeing this uh, trend of a decrease of about 1% per year. And this has been very difficult to get out because, we, of course, we're dealing with an older in instrument now, so all the biases and all the ways that the instrument changes over time have to be taken into consideration. So this was a, a lot of work to get, at, get, get this result out. But it also brings out another real value of Moppet is that is to ground truth, or well, not ground truth, but to space truth, some of the other instruments that have been making similar kind of measurements. And so we've been pro providing a validation standard in many ways to the other instruments that came after, such as AIRS, TESS, and DIAZI. And uh, most of those, uh, uh, most of those um, uh, instruments, you can find uh, joint collaborations where we've, we've worked on doing uh, joint, um, joint uh, papers to look at the MOPID data and the uh, other CO data as well. Moving on towards uh, one of the things that we're interested in doing in the future is near real-time chemical uh, forecasts. And uh, uh, Bill showed this pic figure before. This shows an assimilation, uh, near real-time assimilation of MOPIC data into the Mozart uh, chemical transport model. Uh, and then we do an assimilation, then we run the model forward in forecast mode uh, s several years. And this has been very useful for um, this has been very useful for looking at um, em emission inventory. Sorry, this has been very useful for looking at uh, predictions of where um, we might expect to get some uh, pollution plumes, etc. And this has been used a lot in, fl in, in flight planning for field campaigns. So moving forward, uh, looking forward rather, Moppet was instrumental in. Um, the Moppet measurements were instrumental in going forward and uh, informing one of the decisions for one of the things I've been working on in recent years, which is uh, the potential of having some of these similar kind of measurements of carbon monoxide and other trace gases from uh, geostationary orbits, such that we would have high spatial uh, sampling and, and high uh, uh, temporal sam sampling as well. And so, in fact, the NASA Decadal Survey in 2006 actually called for an instrument very much like Moppet to be included in such such a package. And this is, uh, this, as I say, has been uh, building on the Moppet legacy uh, that uh, we've, we've had with all these wonderful measurements of carbon monoxide uh, going forward. This is informing a lot of the, uh, the needs for, for future air quality monitoring. 
and uh, I personally have been involved in a lot of different proposals to do something similar to this uh, going forward. So Moffitt has got a very strong legacy in that. Now I'm coming out of, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to leave you to uh, uh, read a few of those uh, uh, conclusions. But I just want to finish off by really saying thank you uh, to John for uh, doing producing Moppet and uh, giving us this opportunity, but as I say from the, the beginning, for giving me an opportunity to work in this group and to um, really shape my career as well. So thank you very much, and I congratulate you on your uh, symposium day. And I'll leave you with a few Moppet highlights there. And I'm chairing my own session, so... Uh... <laughs> if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Michael King to uh, PI on the MOVIS instrument, and uh, I'm sure we'll have some uh, interesting things to tell us about Terra. Okay, so my uh, talk today, although I've known John since I was a graduate student, probably 1974, when I was working on the NCAR CC6600 <coughs> at NCAR when I still knew how to program, which I don't remember anymore. Um, but I, so I've overlapped a lot, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the history behind EOS, some thoughts on, on future, some of the backstories people may or may not uh, know, even people who've been involved in this, in this room. So I'll start with, with EOS a little bit. Um, some of the backstory, it was started in 19, early 80s. Um, so I realized that humans have an impact on the environment. But in 1982 to 88, I think Dixon Butler was largely involved in Shelby Tilford and started to do some studies to uh, develop a concept called System Z. And they did a lot of, it was all internal, initially started out all internal NASA and they got a few external people to try to embrace this design study, 82 to 88. And that was happening kind of so almost behind closed doors. Initially, it was supposed to be part of the uh, International Space Station, no Space Station Freedom at the time. And several interesting things happened. 1988, Francis Bretherton was chairing this committee, actually started several years before that. And people probably know about the Bretherton report, but there's some backstory you probably don't know. So of course, Francis was here at, at NCAR and then went to Wisconsin. He was in Wisconsin at this time. And they started to use the term Earth System Science. <clears throat> and I'll get back to the Bretherton diagram in just a second. But So in 88 and 89, there was an announcement of opportunity that was released. It was released in January of 88. And um, probably people can't easily find that, but I've got it on my uh, computer. I also have the, the selection announcements from 89 of who was selected as PI institutions they were at the time and some of the historical things. Uh, so the selections were in 1989, and that was the first time we had meetings. So some of the backstory of the Brethren Report, and this is really hard to find. Uh, it actually was not an NRC report. It was an internal NASA Advisory Committee report. Uh, I think... I, w I once had a copy of this report, but I probably didn't do what Clive did. I, when I retired, I had bushels of cards outside my office. I was throwing out papers. I didn't put them in boxes and store them. So it, and it's hard to find uh, this, re this report, and there's some Google scan versions that are very poor. But what you don't may not know, and part of this the famous diagram, the so-called Brotherhood diagram, was not actually part of the main report. It was a it was a, an overview document that was shorter, and it had interplay between uh, physical climate system, biogeochemical science, and human dimensions. But it actually was, and this is hard for me to imagine in the NASA that I know of recent years, but two of the people on the committee, John Dutton and Barry and Moore, were very keen uh, skiers. And so they decided to have a meeting of this subcommittee at uh, Snow Bunny Lodge in Jackson Hole. I can't even imagine putting that in your travel voucher invoice uh, in the NASA day. And they would plan and discuss science in the morning, and then they'd go skiing in the afternoon, and they'd come back with uh, wine in the evening and, and pontificate. And they had view graph machines, and they were putting things on white boards and coming up with this concept. And Francis wasn't there. 
So we had nothing to do with, uh, with this uh, conceptual model, actually, even though it went into the so-called Brotherton Report. Um, and one of the other participants was got excited and started writing something on the, on the wall like it was a chalkboard, not realizing it was a white wall and it was projecting from a screen. <laughs> and he used uh, permanent magic markers. So <laughs> they had to pay to have the room repainted. And they wanted to know if they could put that in their travel invoice to JPL. But <laughs> in any event, so that, that came out. The other thing you don't, probably don't know is uh, EOS was started, really, in a pr President George H.W. Bush under pressure to show that they, Republicans, love the environment. So they wanted to, didn't want to regulate anything, but they wanted to study it. This probably sounds kind of familiar. The associate minister at the time was Len Fisk, and I can't imagine this in today's uh, politics in Washington either. I, I know Len pretty well. He was called by the White House, a chief science advisor, and told the White House wanted a NASA to develop an earth science program to study the environment, didn't care how much it cost. They allowed NASA to proceed with System Z program, which was renamed EOS, small OS, and later EOS as a capital. The initial runout budget over 30 years was $50 billion. What the public generally knew was a $17 billion through 2000. That was the number that was actually uh, publicly discussed. Well, this led to the, the AO that took the System Z, ported it to uh, the EOS, called for facility teams. PI instrument teams, interdisciplinary science investigation. So that was the original call. Uh, Moppet team was selected with Drummond and Gilly, as you know. There were two competing proposals. One's a high resolution research limb sounder was selected, Gilly and Brasseur. And separately, Dynamics Limb Sounder from Barnett et al. were selected. And those are two that got essentially uh, married together and uh, to become hurdles. There was also an IDS investigation. John was part of Dickinson's IDS investigation. I also was on three, uh, an IDS, an, an instrument PI, and a facility team at that time. Facility team, and these, these were all PI instruments. Uh, facility team, like MODIS, was a concept, but you had to propose an algorithm. You couldn't have any co-investigators. And so I was selected for MODIS, and Yorm Kaufman, whose office was next door to me, was also selected. I didn't know he had proposed until the selections. Uh, early on in EOS, and Guy and others will remember this, there was a, I don't know how they pulled this off, but there was a very tough summer school organized by John Gilley and uh, Guido Visconti from Italy, Enrico, Fermi School of Physics. It was held on Lake Como, Verena, and Lake Como, Italy for two weeks. Huh? Yeah, well, it was a late 12th century villa and former monastery. And we lecture in this chapel's monastery. So uh, Guy was one of the lecturers, Jim Drummond, Reinhard Beer. I was there on Modus, John Gillian Hurdles. Uh, Michael McIntyre, who was shown one slide earlier, was there. Mark Schober, well, there were quite a few. Of course, Tony Slingo. So, the school was held the end of June. Now, this is a, a book cover of it, which I have the hard copy of. There's no PDF of anything. This is long before PowerPoint and stuff. Um, and there's a photograph of the group in there, but it's poor quality, black and white, so I didn't bother to, to scan it. But it was, it was a tough uh, school. We'd lecture for an hour in the morning, and then we'd go out to the terrorists and have tea, and then we'd go back and lecture two hours, and we had the whole afternoon off. We'd come back for a one hour, lecture before dinner, and then went to dinner and wine. It was really tough. Then after four or five days of this hard work, he had a week and a, a day and a half off. And uh, so this is two weeks. Uh, um, uh, Jim Holton was there uh, all two weeks with his wife, Margaret. <clears throat> so anyway, so the EOS program got started. So this was a way to describe. There were instruments described in this course. There were 100 students, some of which, like uh, Hyrus, Jeff Dozier described, got deselected later and did, never did fly. Um, I was originally the MODIS deputy team leader. I'm now, now a team leader and have been for quite a while. This is a backstory on me. This much for my wife wasn't happy. My appointment was signed by Dan Golden, NASA administrator, on election day between the George H.W. Bush administration and the Clinton administration. He was a George H.W. Bush appointee 
and I had to revoke my right to career tenure and switch to a different kind of category in this, which my wife was a little bit nervous about. It ended up working out okay. <laughs> But I was responsible for algorithm development for all 20 EOS instrument teams and DAO, which now became GMAO. So a lot of the algorithm like Moppet, I would fund those. Uh, Gossam had the, was responsible for the international IDS investigations at headquarters, and he started the graduate student program, which there are many beneficiaries of. Um, the other thing I talked to Lynn Fisk about, the NASA that I worked with for 30 years, I can't conceive of them doing this today, but. When I was selected, I wasn't quite 40. Chris Justice wasn't 40. Pierce Sellers, uh, Yorm Kalfin had just turned 40. There were a lot of uh, late 30s people, and they've been young. They were quite creative in their career, but they were such that they could survive that. And a lot of the older people didn't propose because they didn't really understand whether interdisciplinary science was workable. They were more discipline focused. And I asked when was this a strategic decision to select intentionally young, early, mid-career people. And he says, no, he had to remember that he was 45 when he was associate administrator at the time. It didn't seem all that young to him, but it was not an, an explicit decision. But it turned out uh, to allow many of us to basically grow our careers through, through this program. Um, but the euphoria that uh, of the big budget, which doesn't sound real to anybody in the, coming into the field today, uh, didn't last all that long. There were a lot of, uh, I call reductions, but they were called rescoping, restructuring, <laughs> rebaseline, a lot of things where you would lose costs, first 17 to 11, and 11 to 8, and you dropped Hyrus, and uh, several instruments were deselected. Uh, the hurdles was put together by two different uh, proposals. Moppet had a competitor from Langley that was also put together. Um, so it was a very somewhat trying time, but eventually we uh, developed things. Part of the things we did also to stabilize the program is we worked on the science, science plan. There were many chapters. Uh, John Gilley contributed to the atmospheric chemistry chapter. And there was an executive summary of people who can't read the regular plan and reference handbooks. And these science plan is available in PF, has actually been used by Tony Busawaki to teach at the University of Maryland. It's been used as, as backstory for teaching, um, although it's still valid. Early on, we did, and I ran it crosswise with some unnamed person at NASA headquarters over this, but we did some data products handbooks to tell people what are the data files, who the principal, who's the main responsible person. We did one, uh, volume one, which was trim, Terra data simulation. I think we did that two different editions, I believe. Um, volume two, Acromsat, and then we never did one that included Aura because I was getting a lot of back back flack from headquarters on printed documents. First of all, they told me nobody at headquarters has time to read, to look at the World Wide Web. They only want to print documents, but they didn't want me to spend money uh, printing documents either. So I, anyway, so we never did that. One of the other things I did for ELS, but I got the idea from Joe Waters from the URs MLS world, is established this algorithm theoretical document basis document process. We got a lot of the reviewers. I got people from all the panels. I get people from internationally always, and I pay for them to travel. We conducted seven separate reviews. Terra was done twice, Aqua twice, and uh, Omi and Aura only once. They never got a repeat. The idea was to get the science community to to look at the documentation of how we were going to process the algorithms, what are the assumptions, what are the physics basis should, and it was to be done early on so that if there were some gotchas or some other ideas, we could change that in the early development phase. Headquarters today thinks these ought to be updated constantly as living documents for teaching that you'd always the latest version of things, and that was never really the intent. Um, there were overall 10 different EOS missions. Uh, Landsat 7 was, that was one of the reductions. Things were, Landsat 7 was added to the program uh, when NOAA and DOD bailed. 
NASA got it completely, but with no new money. So it got incorporated by name in the EOS, but no new money. Uh, had to eat it. Quiscat, Terra, and this is kind of the or order of their uh, launches, but uh, there were 10 overall. Uh, although there are two instruments, their EOS instruments are put on trim as well. So Liz and Sears. I did this actually for Ed Weiler many years ago, but you might find this of interest. Uh, Ed was the director of Goddard at that time. This is the history of the funding for just the algorithms, calibration, and validation. So it does not include the IDS investigations, and this is the NASA-funded part. And it, start, and it went up to $160 million a year. And there's a number of the investigators, co-investigators, there are many different countries involved. Uh, there's also a statement in there when full cost accounting went and changed the meaning of, of uh, dollars. So the Terra was a uh, picture was shown uh, several times of its launch. We're coming up, I guess, the week of the AGU is the 15th anniversary of the launch of, of Terra. And of course, I'm head of the MODIS team, but this is part of the uh, payload. Moppet is, is still working. Actually, everything is working. One aspect of series not. Um, so the other thing we did, um, and NCAR, and well, some of the community was involved, we've done a lot of different field campaigns of validation over the time. Uh, one of the first ones done for Terra was Safari 2000 in Africa. That was chosen for a couple of reasons, but the, the meteorology of Southern Africa uh, the, uh, in the winter, August, September, is the circulation pattern. So biomass burning in Zambia comes, and smoke comes out in Angola, South Africa. The uh, big NO2 source, the coal-fired the coal power plants, pollution goes from South Africa into Mozambique and around. So it's a mixing bowl, and we can set up towers, aircraft, and uh, I saw uh, Novelli, you mentioned Paul Novelli had an instrument on there measuring in situ, CO there, and on the ER2 payload, uh, Jim Drummond had the Moppet A, Mo Moppet Airborne Instrument. And actually, one time I funded John. I don't know what ever happened. There's a matter Mo Moppet Airborne Test Radiometer here at NCAR. I don't really know what they did with it. But in any event, this was the complement of the instruments that were on, on that. One of the things we know, or I know, from 15 years of MODIS data, from Terra and Aqua is that the planet's like 80% cloudy. So if you're looking for clear sky stuff, looking down the troposphere for a mop and stuff, you have a lot of uh, interference that to me as a cloud person is just fine, but for some of you it may be in, in the way. Um, this is a time series, this is what I've published. It goes through 2011, I guess we could extend it, but basically on the top is the uh, cloud fraction over the ocean, land, and total. So the ocean is cloudier than the land, is cl and the different solid dash weather is terror in the morning or aqua in the afternoon. So the land is cloudier in the afternoon, the ocean is cloudier in the morning, and total planet doesn't make a difference whether it's morning or afternoon in terms of the cloudiness, the so 67% of some seasonal cycle. So. Uh, just to wrap up a little bit on this part of the history, on the back story is EOS has enabled quantitative retrievals of atmosphere, land, and ocean products, which have increased dramatically because of calibration, instrument attention to details, and, and technology infusion, different, different points in time. Uh, prior, there was a lot of uncalibrated sensors, at least in the short wave that I worked in mostly, that were used for other things but weren't really designed for the purpose to which they were used. Um, there, today we have an ar unprecedented array of spaceborne sensors, so we're kind of in the golden age of Earth observations, and some are getting quite old, all of them are getting quite old, past the prime, prime time, and fortunately, uh, in a lot of ways, I think the instruments were probably over-engineered, or at least engineered very well. It was very common in those days to build engineering models as well as flight models. 
Uh, Modus, in fact, had two phase B studies, two different companies doing phase B up to a certain level, and then they down selected and competed for CD to build. NASA would never do that today. We have a lot of engineering models which become the, the warehouse that we're now refurbishing to find the International Space Station other missions because we have this extra stuff. So Liz that flew on trim in 1997, there's an engineering model that is being uh, modified to find the International Space Station. I mean, we, we're going to run out of spare parts in the, in the store, but we uh, did very good engineering and they've lasted a very good time, a long time, and we're very uh, grateful for that. Also, the computation capabilities and availability of uh, being able to distribute data. Everybody wants the latest thing today, and, but there's a lot of value in the historical record. I guess you know, we're talking to Ann at, at uh, break about that. The long term data, the longer the record, the more valuable things become in, in some sense. Um, the future is a little more clouded, other than the fact that I'll be retired again. Uh, I am currently on two NRC committees, one of which is uh, formulating the decadal survey, or will form the next decadal survey in earth science. Uh, I told them I'm either too, I'm too old, I don't want to chair it or be on it, so I probably won't have anything to do with it, but it'll start up in next January, February to look at uh, the future decade. But out of the last decadal survey done, uh, 2007 or so, I think, by the time the decadal survey starts, one of which will have been launched summer and well in development, but it's, Fry Oak is pretty open. It's really a, a 20 year or multi decadal survey in the development time of these things. Um, the other thing that's happened is you know, a compensation of Hurricane Sandy in politics, as NOAA has essentially been told, focus on weather only, not climate. And so everything that NOAA was supposed to develop on sensors is being thrown back to NASA and with not necessarily the funding. So one of the studies that uh, Farley asked the committee I'm on NRC to formulate is one to look at long-term con continuity, how you decide what should be long-term continuous measurements versus what should be process studies, one of the kind. And that report a draft is finished today, and it's going out to 10 reviewers, and we'll deal with all that. But that, so the next executive survey will have to look at how you balance new technology and fusion new ideas together with a long-term sustained continuity requirement with no new money. Out of the NASA budget, um, 1.8 billion, 55% is flight hardware, some is RNA, and, and they're not gonna increase the percentage of the flight program, but they will be more continuity as well as new technology and a lot of missions in the queue. So one of the things being discussed a lot is, do you start with a clean slate of, slate of paper, sheet of paper and start designing a new program separately, which is probably not a good idea, or you take the previous recommendations that haven't been developed but a lot of money has been spent on uh, phase B or studies and revalidate or assess the technology readiness and stuff. So. It'll probably be the latter or the other. There's a lot of tension associated with cost modeling, too. But so the future is cloudy, and uh, the young and mid career people, I wish you luck. But thus far, we've had a good ride of Earth observations. So thank you. Any questions or comments from one? Uh, Kevin? Oh. Kevin? Yeah. Kevin? Of the continuity report? Congratulations. For the previous decade of survey? Um, that's a whole complicated story. So they were estimates of the proposers. I wasn't on the decade of survey, first of all. I was in Barian's office. I was too senior and asked to be allowed. So I was not on it. But I know they had cost estimates from some of the proponents. They also had some centers do cost estimating. And some of the cost estimates, I just, just reading the report when it first came out, it was pretty clear were pretty fallacious. One dealing with launch vehicle rocket costs, which were not realistic in one particular mission. And this time, 
Congress has actually changed, this is not in the continuity report, you'll see, but this is one of the other aspects is Congress has made a requirement that any indicator survey, which they love, by the way, should have a, a so-called Kate report. Uh, it's an independent cost analysis by Aerospace Corporation. And so there will be consistent cost estimating, but how does aerospace do it? The parametric models that Goddard uses or JPL uses are based on, on weight, power, and history. If you're doing new technology, you don't necessarily know that. And they will add contingency and stuff. And so one of the things that Freilich wants to avoid is, is having a mission defined to the level that you have to have a, a cost estimating. We like to have concepts and let the centers do design studies. So that's one of the bones of contention in the statement of task. The other bone of contention in the new one is that Noah, or more particularly Kathy Sullivan, didn't want anything to do with that cable service. We're trying to persuade her otherwise, uh, because Noah should be a player, even though they ignored the three they were assigned the last time. The cost estimation, though, was very problematic in the last time. And so there was a midterm assessment, which I didn't talk about, but I, I was one of the reviewers of that. And that emphasized it should be fixed costs and you should really control the cost and not let it grow out and have de-scope options and we did a lot of that in the US. We we would cut instruments off or we would go to con go to uh, de-scope options and I think some of these missions just kept growing when implemented. So it's a complicated answer and it's not part of the continuity study but it's it will be a bone of contention a little bit what we do in the next decade. On. Yeah, you pr well, I know a couple of people have copies. I'd like them to, to take it apart and scan and make a proper PDF and then just spiral it back together so you can actually see it. Because all I could find, I don't have the hard copy anymore. When I retired once and moved here, I lost it. Uh, so if you want to do a proper scan, I'll get a good copy of it. I can't find it on the web anyplace other than this Google scan one, which is, I don't know, well, they didn't take it apart. So it's a small pictures and poor resolution. And I think it would be nice to have that someplace that would be documented, yeah. It's a historical note, you mentioned the, uh, well, the, um, the AO for uh, EOS. When that came out, or at least during that period, there, I think there was a, a rumor that they expected that maybe the first launch could take place before the end of the second term of the George H. W. Bush administration. And, uh, and then the, uh, uh, our Moffat Airborne Test Radio on the matter. Uh, we flew it, a paper was written on it, and it's uh, in the basement of the building where we'll have the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the uh, reception tonight. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, next talk is going to be by Jim Drummond, and uh, my guess is it's going to be about Moffat. <laughs> this is very interesting because you, you're getting three different pe people's views of the same period of history um, <laughs> from three very different uh, perspectives. Um, so th I dragged this out of my archive. This was a talk I gave, you'll notice, uh, eight, 10 days before we launched uh, Terra. Uh, and the title was, yes, we are nearly there. And the question is, you know, <laughs> where, where is there? So John Gilly and I share a history in nimbuses, uh, or nimbi, or something. I'm, not, I'm never sure of the plural. Um, we were both working on nimbuses in the 1970s. The thing I really like is, look at these dates. 70s, 70s, we were launching on three-year centers, you know. Ah, yeah. oh, those were the days. Um, we, we never actually really sort of crossed paths. Um, and it wasn't until 1987, that, that 1987 was a really bad year for me. It's really bad to read in the national newspaper that your project has been canceled. Um, and so I came down to NCAR for a six month sabbatical with sort of a program in complete disarray. In fact, it wasn't really clear I was gonna continue in the field. And uh, you know, various people, John and, and Mankin and, and Coffey and, and people were very kind to me at that time. And we were having one of these conversations in the cafeteria and it was John, I remember distinctly, who said, you know, if you can do this, uh, and this, we were doing stratospheric work with correlation radiometers for the stratosphere, why can't you do it for the lower atmosphere? Well, that's an interesting question. I didn't have anything better to do because everything had been canceled. So, oh dear, now I've done something awful. How do we get this back? 
Okay, right, so we'll do something that's about. <laughs> so I, I settled down and, and sort of thought about how we did. And as, as uh, was said before, the problem is that the pressure in the pressure modulator can't be made high enough, and so you need a new way of modulation. And short, st long story short, uh, we came up with the, uh, with the length modulated radiometer. And that, that was sort of very much an academic exercise, got published in the Pride Optics in um, 1988 or 89, I think. And so that sort of didn't really seem like it was going anywhere. And, and then along came the EOS juggernaut. Uh, and I, of course, was sort of at the other end of this. Um, and the AO came out. And uh, so John and I put together, uh, along with Guy and Jack McConnell, who's sadly no longer with us, uh, put together this concept for the Moppet instrument. And I have still got original copies of this, even though it was done. Um, don't read it, okay? It's, it's a real, <laughs> it would never go anywhere today. Uh, but hey, we, you know, we put it in and, and people thought it was pretty good. The, the instrument was gonna weigh 30 kilograms and um, it was gonna consume 50 watts of power and have a one kilobit per second data rate. Uh, it had four fields of view. It was gonna use lead sulfide detectors. I can hear people cringing there. Um, it was gonna be radiation cooled and so on. Um, we got selected, and, and I'm sort of condensing history here. By 1990, uh, we'd uh, refined our ideas and uh, got some equations now to go with the, uh, <laughs> with the, with the description. And uh, we had this instrument, Moppet, that now has Stirling cycle coolers and four fields of view and looks pretty much like the Moppet that you know and love. Um, can't see a pointer under here. But it's on the top, on the top, right on the top, right. Okay, uh, and you, you might sort of wonder what this big thing is, that this is so that it can sit on the polar orbiting platform. And here's one of the concepts of the polar orbiting platform. This was this huge thing. Uh, it had four rows of uh, instruments. It was going to be serviced by astronauts who were going to service it from the International Space Station. Now, I always use this as an example for my uh, classes. This is going to be in a polar orbit. orbit. The space station is in a 60-something degree inclination orbit. Somewhere I have seen, and I, if anybody finds it, there is a picture of this thing, the space station, and an astronaut on what looks like a small motorcycle with no <laughs> wheels. <laughs> anybody finds that picture? I want to see it, OK? <laughs> OK, well, here it is with Stirling cycle coolers. You've already seen the, the cutaway. We were using pressure modulators and lift modulators. Um, and so this was the first instrument. This was the first Moppet. This was the instrument that we designed. OK, now you, you sort of have to build one. <laughs> and so we built an EQM. This is a picture of the EQM. We built a wooden model <laughs> to show how it worked. We built a calibration facility. And basically, we, we built model number two, which is the Moppet that we actually built. There it is. And it got put on the, uh, the Terra spacecraft. And it got launched. Got launched on December the 18th, 1999, 1857 GMT. It was supposed to be launched on the 17th, but there was a problem with the, uh, with the launch sequence, and that got put off. And it was launched nine seconds before the end of the launch window on the 18th. If it hadn't been launched then, they would have shut the range for Christmas, and does anyone remember that thing called Y2K? <laughs> they would have kept the range shut through the new year, okay, until uh, 2000 and something. So it wouldn't have been launched in 1999, it would have been launched in 2000. And so we just squeaked in to the 1999. What is interesting is, is shortly after launch, uh, the, the 21st, uh, you'll remember, is the solstice. And on the 21st, the uh, the guidance system of the spacecraft tried to divide by the, by the cosine of 90 degrees and got a not a number and went into safe mode. And because of Y2K, it was held in safe mode right the way through uh, Christmas and the new year and into the new year, except that we all had to stay at Goddard in the control room in case something happened. And so we had the unenviable thing of having absolutely nothing to do because everything was in safe mode and Everybody else was celebrating and we were doing nothing. 
So we got it going, and of course you get your excitement, you know, the gain trend. Uh, uh, this is due to water vapor contamination on the detector, which we then get rid of. So on everything started going quite well. Uh, we had temperature trends and so on. And so this was the third instrument. I always believe you build, you have three instruments. The one you design, there's the one you build, and the one that ends up in orbit. And this is the one that ended up in orbit. And so uh, David's already shown this, and I usually make the same jokes that he did, so I'll <laughs> skip on that and move forward. Uh, we got the first CO map. And, and now we're moving from, you know, before we launched, there was a lot of skepticism that you could actually do this. I mean, I, I remember many sort of notes written and telecons and so on from various people who said you can't do that. You know, all you're going to measure is temperature. You don't measure. So we sort of moved from you can't do that to can't you do that any better. Um, and you know, this is a, a V6 data. David mentioned um, you know John's fanaticism for for validation. And th that's very interesting because it, uh, because the instrument has lasted so long, that has become extremely important. It was important to start with, okay? But that trend stuff and so on that, that we're looking at now is only possible because of the very careful validation that's been done. And you know, I, th I think it's fair to say the Moppet data set is a trusted data set. People actually believe some of it, except the people who produce it, of course, but that's a... And so, you know, I, I always say basically that what we've done is that this is Hank Richley's, and, and you have to remember that Hank stuff was done in, in 1994, produced this shuttle uh, image, and uh, what we've done is, you know, fill in a lot of gaps on that to make an image. So it was shortly after launch, um, we were starting to get this, uh, this new information. You could start to see, uh, you know, these... Uh, waves of CO on the planet, you start to see uh, CO moving across the uh, Pacific Ocean, and uh, this caught somebody's attention, uh, Rush Limbo. Do you remember this one, John? Rush Limbo got hold of it, and uh, the problem with this is, is that he, uh, he doesn't understand, if you read this, and I'm not asking you to read it, he's got muddled between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. <laughs> And so he's using the two interchangeably and, and showing how there can't be any increase in carbon dioxide over the United States because uh, the fact that it's, uh, it's being dissipated as it comes out of China. It's, a, it's hard to describe how muddled it is. <laughs> um, but, you know, this, you know, this goes on and on and, and, and so on. And uh, we, we had a teleconference with NASA about it and... and you know, trying to decide how we're going to deal with this. And my advice was not to do anything because those people who knew about it would find it extremely amusing. And, and those people who didn't know anything about it, you'd spend far too long trying to explain it. It just wouldn't work. So <laughs> it went away. But, but that's kind of interesting in the, in the kind of attention that you get. Um, Moppet was, has not been without its problems. Um, in 2001... Uh, we suffered our first cooler anomaly um, in that we, uh, we lost 50% of the instrument. You remember if you saw the uh, um, <coughs> optical diagram, we have two optical tables. We lost one of them, basically. But that was good because you know, we had the design right to, uh, to lose that. And then uh, in almost immediately after that, we had a chopper anomaly in which one of our choppers stopped. In a breathtaking um, rescue from near death, it stopped open. It didn't stop closed. It stopped open. And by reworking the, uh, the data processing, because we had insisted on doing digital data processing and not analog data processing on the instrument, we, we were actually able to get uh, the data back. And not only did we get the data back, the performance actually improved slightly, which justified Guy Peskett's comment from the beginning of the project that we didn't need the choppers. <laughs> Now, everything that's happened since then has been of a much more minor nature. Um, we've reset the coolers so that they work, but with a bit of uh, mechanical wear and so on, we have to stop occasionally and, and reset that. Um, but really, uh, nothing really much has happened uh, since 2001. And, and here we are in 2014, 
uh, less than a month from 15 years up, which is amazing. I'm thinking of suing the manufacturers for over-design. <laughs> and so, you know, here's the, uh, the engineering performance. Um, this is one of the channels uh, that we keep a very close eye on. Um, and starting in 2000, this is half a percent in change. These downwards are just due to the water vapor accumulating on the detector, which every year uh, we burn off. We don't burn it off every year because that's when it gets um, too much for the instrument. We burn it off every year because if we don't do it every year, we forget how to do it. <laughs> and so, what is interesting, you know, as we've gone on, you know, we, we've had to re-educate generations of people into how to do a decontamination. Um, and so, for the first uh, few years, pretty much nothing happened. We're slowly showing this very slow, maybe about one and a half percent loss in signal. Um, the difference channels have been moving rather faster. This is five percent here, um, and so we're going down, um, but not at a uh, an extraordinary rate. We certainly haven't seen any real impact in the data quality. And, and I think this is our mascot for the uh, little while. And so now we, we have this enormous data set. Now I was reminded by uh, a NASA official that the original uh, program for EOS had three satellites, one after the other. There were going to be three Moppets on three satellites. Remember this? Um, one after the other, each of which was going to have a five-year mission, and we were going to accumulate a 15-year data set. But assuming we keep going for about another 30 days, <laughs> we will have achieved the original objective on one satellite. Uh, and the advantage of that is we haven't had to cross-calibrate the instruments and, and deal with all the instruments. So really, this is you know pretty good stuff. And so this is, uh, I, I had my sum, one of my summer students this uh, year um, produce a sort of uh, state and province average map for uh, uh, CO over the, uh, over the US and Can Canada exists, okay? There is stuff above this line, okay? Um, uh, we, we lost Alaska. And so that's what happens in 2000, and this is what happens in 2013. And you see pretty well over the entire, if you watch that particularly, the color scale is consistent. You're seeing actually a significant reduction uh, in CO over the, uh, and of course we have all the years in between and so on. And I always argued in the early days that you could never use an instrument like Moppet for trend detection because you know it just wasn't precise enough. So you guys at NCAR, kudos to you. Okay. So the the next question is how long is it going to last? Okay. And we had a meeting. Uh, down here in the summer talking about you know how Terra goes on and I really did like the suggestion that we should propose to NASA a Terra 2 mission uh, with the same instruments it's a five year mission uh, it starts uh, in uh, 2015 it's very cheap you don't have to launch it you don't have to build the instruments it's up there already you just have to keep going <laughs> I, I think it's just great um, we're looking that the critical things probably are the cell pressures um, they're both good for at least another 10 years. Um, the satellite probably will not last that long because it's running out of fuel. 20, depending on you know, which scenario you use, 2012, 2013. So John's original question, if you can do it for the stratosphere, why can't you do it for the lower atmosphere? John, I've now answered that. We can do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm very honored too. And as you already got the perspective of Jim and David, I'll give you my perspective of Moppet. Uh, it will be a different perspective because it's for, from abroad. So. And so um, I'll talk a bit about Moppet, about Yazi, and about other things. 
Okay, so I didn't know how to start, so I remember that, John, you, you speak French fluently, so, but I'll, I'll you know, talk in English for the, for the rest of the room. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so when you type John Gillet on Google, and when you really there is one, so that's not Gillet, um, that's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, basically, it's a company, John Gillet Company, and they're uh, sell, selling a, a pinball machine. <laughs> what I like about that is that um, I think it fits quite well with your personality because it says quality, solidity, and uh, long-term service and design. And I thought it's it's <laughs> really important to that. Right? And they, they say that they, they like to help <coughs> satisfied customers, which is also the case for the mobile product, uh, best quality product, so it's improved, uh, optimal service. You, so Jim just mentioned that, that Ankara we did very well for the accuracy of the data and a well-motivated team. And so that all fits very well with what you do here at NCA with the Muppet instrument. <laughs> <laughs> so can you go in and just drive away? Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I think it's just a parking lot. So. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so now how did I start to, to work uh, with John on the Muppet uh, um, mission? So it, it, it took a while, in fact. So how did it start? I think the first time I came to NCAR, it was in 1991, I attended this uh, summer school organized by Chris Cantrell on atmospheric chemistry. And at the time I was a student, I was a PhD student, I was doing spectroscopy in a quite boring lab, uh, work in the lab. And so when I attended this summer school, I found that it's a great um, subject of research, atmospheric chemistry, much more open-minded than what I was doing at, at the time. And also, I really like Encore, so I, should, I said I should go back. And uh, then the year after, so this is my old photograph of uh, <laughs> So the year uh, after, so I was uh, trying to uh, give a direct, different direction uh, to my PhD, and I was doing still um, laboratory measurement, but I was measuring um, cross-section of uh, replacement of CFC, and uh, in fact, at that time, and John and Claire Carney in particular was uh, trying to, um, was also working on that, and she, she, was, she had a goal to calculate the global warming potential. So that gave me the opportunity to visit ENCA. And so during my stay at ENCA, we, we, there was the Ozone Symposium, and that's when the picture was taken. And somebody before mentioned it, uh, important moment in your life that you don't know at that time that they are important. But that's an important moment of my life because I met him. I also met, met this guy, um, Gérard Meiji, that became my boss, in fact, two years after. I didn't know him at the time, in fact. So that's during my PhD. And then um, I'm done with my PhD uh, in 1993, and I moved to Paris, in fact. And I start to work uh, with Gérard Meiji on a nice satellite mission. So I try to design it, and it's called Yazi. It's supposed to be launched on Meetup. They, they would say to me at the time, a few years after, so it's quite vague. Um, but they were in the process of designing the instrument. Uh, trying to, uh, he, he was saying to me, OK, you will develop the retrieval algorithm for this mission. So, great. And then I started to work on that. But uh, I never realized at that time how long it will drift in time that before the Yazi was launched. So that's a year after. And so I still have no, no data. I'm still working on retrieval algorithms, of course. That's even a year after, I still know this, thing and now everything is moving forward. And um, I think at that time, they even said, oh, we don't know when the launch will happen. So I started to be depressed. I got a permanent position, which helped. And also, which helped, in fact, is that the IMG instrument was launched on Adios. And in 1997, the, the solar panel had T2, so the mission uh, stopped operating. And the benefit for me was that they released the data immediately then. And so that gave me at least some data to look after at with my uh, algorithm that we are supposed to work on Yazi. So Yazi is still drifting away. And um, so that, that's a start, but we only had a few days of data. So I said, OK, um, I don't play golf yeah, like me. So, uh, <laughs> wait, so during these years, I said, OK, I should, I should work uh, with people who have access to data. and. The Mopi team was uh, already advertising well, in fact, what they were planning to do soon. So I, 
I did in my archives, and I found this email that I sent you, John. I don't knew, know you at that time because I'm calling you dear Dr. Billy, which is very <laughs> And so I present myself, okay, I say where I'm working, and I say, okay, uh, I'm working on this mission, and I would like to come to Anka and work with you uh, uh, at that time. And you, lastly, you that I would very much like to have you visit next summer. So that, that I did, and the next summer, spe I spent three months, in fact, working on data simulation with uh, Boris Katatov and Jean-François Lamarck, and it was very nice. So I spent three months there, so I'm very happy, so I'm saying thanks and everything. And you nicely replied, okay, I also hope it will be possible for you to come again. I heard you. <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that collaboration with Mopil will continue, so I am. Um, and as you know, I've, I came back several times since then. So that, but that was a great opportunity for me to, to um, be able to work uh, with the NCAR people. Okay, this is one year later that I still digging uh, to my email account, and I, invite, I forgot totally this story, in fact. I invited you to um, participate to a jury for my PhD student, Juliet. And you say, oh, that would be good, but uh, the problem is that uh, there's a plan to uh, launch MOPIP. Uh, and at that time, it, it was December 14th. So as you heard before, a few days after it was launched. <coughs> so I totally forgot about that story. OK. So a few, a few years, years later, you have all this very nice mission. I'm still waiting for, for Yazin. <laughs> and so finally, in 2006, Yazin is launched. But in the re meanwhile, I was lucky enough to be able to make some longer stay at NCAR. Um, so when I was really tired of waiting, I, I stayed at NCAR for 18 months. And during that time, I really had the opportunity to work with uh, the MOPIC data. Um, and that was really great. And I think it's really changed the way I was um, looking at uh, satellite data because I, I had developed some algorithms and I thought, okay, uh, we have to improve these algorithms. But at that time, I realized that uh, the difficult part of the game is more handling this huge data flow. And so that's how I really, uh, I was looking at, uh, you had already several years of data, and I was um, working on the, I think it was uh, six years or five years, no, four years of data. That was a lot of data. And uh, I, I really learned how to uh, handle such a big amount of data. And that was really helpful to me. So I also learned how to understand the averaging kernel and so on. And I think that was really helpful. So that when the YAT instrument was launched, uh, we were really ready to analyze all this data the best we can. And so as you can see, there are, uh, since then I came every summer, I think it. Sometimes I stay longer at NCAR. And uh, that's really great that uh, we, have, we have several joint publications now with uh, <coughs> the MOPI team. OK. So I have three more serious slides now. Um, this last three summers, I think I've been working hard with David, Helen, and Merit. Uh, in fact, to really compare what the Yazi data provides and what the MOP data provides. Um, at the start, uh, I think yeah, like three summers ago, we thought, OK, you know, let's do that during the two months uh, I'm here. And it proved to be much more difficult to what I thought at the start, in fact. So you see. On this image, you have the overpass of Mopit and Yazi. So it's a, it's a totally different instrument. Uh, so the CO product might look similar when you look at maps, but it's a very different instrument. The overpass time, so Yazi uh, is uh, 9.30 and uh, Mopit is 10.30, so you have measurements one hour after what the Yazi satellite provides. But the difficulty is that we have a, a very different way to um, retrieve the data. And so that um, requested a lot of work, in fact, to be able to properly compare the YASI data and the MOPI data, because we really wanted to assess what the differences are. And so on this map here, you sh that's an average over the April month uh, for the YASI mission, you see that it's looking quite similar to what you have with MOPIT. And the tricky one to obtain is this one, because it's MOPIT, but using the a priori of YASI. That seems easy, like I, uh, I'm saying it, and it's proved to be very complicated to do in fact. What we did um, is, in fact, using, so for Yazi, uh, as Mopit was doing that in the first session of the algorithm, uh, we use a single a priori profile 
and for what we now use variable occurrence, changing mm -hmm. the season and location, and uh, also the covariance matrix looks very different. And even the products, um, you retrieve uh, log VMR and we retrieve uh, portion count, for example. And just to rebuild the matrices was very complicated because um, it had to be uh, done very uh, carefully. And so it, it, it took a, us a while to do it and now it's almost done, so the paper is ready to be published. Um, it's, uh, it's, it was really, uh, I think it's useful to the community, but it was really a lot of work. That it's very useful for us to better understand the project. And um, when I'm here, before I, I, I jump to a, my other slide, I should say that the, the word averaging kernel, I'm seeing that I think every day. So I'm more impressed to be in front of Clive here <laughs> than in front of the Pope, I think. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so um, when comparing the Yazi and Moffitt data, that's we did that on, on several little areas that are representative of different ecosystems. We did that during all the years where we have common measurements for the two missions. And in fact, uh, it was impossible to uh, reprocess the whole six years with the Yazi error because it's very computing demanding. So we did it, this for several little areas. What you would see is that is in general, you have the variability with uh, the vertical bars, and you have Moffitt in blue and Yazi in red. And as you can see, it compares very well, except for some area. And in, in fact, we could identify later that when you swap to the Yazi API, in fact, this over this area, it's improved quite a lot. And as David mentioned before, there was also this ability to retrieve profile. And here again, we compare, in fact, the Moffitt profile with the Yazi profile, and also the Moffitt product. This is the Moffitt product. Um, <coughs> using the YASI API. Um, so that's a very uh, nice achievement, I think, uh, that we could obtain. OK, some statistics. Um, during, this is the number of data. That's the, not the number, total number of MOPI data in YASI data. That's the data we use for this analysis. That's the, the common data that we use. So I thought, OK, during all this period, I, I've worked less closely to John, because no, um, I work more with David Helen and, and so on. But I thought, okay, what did John did during this time? And I, th I, I had lunch uh, several times with John, and something that really strikes me that is very different to what we do is that here, and John in particular, drink milk uh, at lunch. And that's very surprising because uh, in France and Belgium, you never drink milk at lunch. You can drink wine or whatever, but not milk. <laughs> So during the, all this data that <laughs> we have, so I think you, you, you in fact drank like I cannot count in gallons what that means. <laughs> okay, and that all makes sense, I think, because the first thing I saw when I, I went into your office is what you have in front of your office, and that's that. So I think you are very <laughs> consistent, <laughs> because milk and, and the cheese, and, and I always wonder why you wrote a uh, big cheese here. <laughs> so no, I'm Okay, so thank you very much, John. And I, I'm not very, um, I don't like milk too much, but I like chocolate, so I brought you some chocolate. <laughs> 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 It's Belgium chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we brought these up too. <laughs> Anybody who have any questions or comments? <laughs> All right, I think it's break time, and maybe there'll be any chocolate, I don't know. Um, we're going to have an opportunity for people to give. Oh, yes, we're going to have a... Who wants to come and say something embarrassing about John? Now we're away. Gerald! All of you know John is really good at balancing lots of different projects at once. And he has operated with the just-in-time um, rule of thumb. So if it's due tomorrow, I'm working on it. Maybe tomorrow, but possibly today. <laughs> uh, and this story comes back, uh, so this is in the days before the internet. I think it's probably before FedEx. Uh, I was busy in my office one afternoon, and John came in and he said, I need you to drive me to the airport. 
and i said ok and he said well the purpose is and i think it was the hurdles proposal had been shipped off and he wanted to have me drive him down so on the way back he could busily look through the proposal make sure all of the figures that needed to be changed were changed and sign the document himself so i drove down so he could read on the way back as soon as we got back then that document was handed off to larry lijack larry lijack had the opportunity to drive all the way to breckenridge because at that point the ncar director was at a meeting in breckenridge this proposal needed a signature from the ncar director so he drove up to breckenridge drove it back down and i think then it got back onto an airplane to go to wherever so um you know this this was an illustration of of uh, john's philosophy of let's put it off to the last minute if we can <laughs> I've been fortunate enough to work with John for a long time. In fact, I think I was the first employee he hired at um, NCAR. Uh, he brought Paul Bailey with him from Florida State, but then he hired me shortly thereafter. I moved over from HAO, where we had developed a high-resolution spectrometer on an airplane, and I brought the same equipment and flew it on the same airplane. But now, instead of looking in between the absorption lines to see the sun, we looked at the absorption lines. One man's signals, another man's death. Uh, trash noise and so uh, that was been you know, one of John's favorite sayings is it's better to be born lucky than smart <laughs> I was always a little offended because he always said this right after I'd come up with what I thought was one of my more brilliant ideas <laughs> <laughs> however it's certainly true John was a lot smarter than I but I was lucky because I worked for him <laughs> John also had luck, but sometimes, as in the case of Hurdles and the Apton, it was bad luck. And so it took an awful lot of smarts from John and the people that he assembled to work with him to uh, make a, uh, a pretty nice silk purse out of that sow's ear. <laughs> and so uh, I have had a wonderful ride to uh, work with John for all these years, and it's been a pleasure, John.